Kirillo, so how much of your net worth do you have in crypto? So now it's 99.9%. But it was not always like that. So I'll give you my personal story. So basically when the war started in Ukraine back in the early 2022, I had a real estate and something in the bank and obviously crypto. But then we need to uh, we needed to go with my family, like what we were having, just grabbing the documents and the kids jumping in the car and leaving the country. The whole situation was crazy. Obviously, banks were not working, ATMs were not working, gas stations was not working because the people were fleeing out of the country. And through the customs, you cannot bring more than 10,000 euros always with you. So that's where the crypto demonstrated the new use case not just a charity when you can send uh, any money to everyone immediately without any borders, document, commissions, etc. But you, you, are, you are free to move your capital. You can protect against inflation. So basically invest in this capital and get the profits out of it. And also be able to send your transactions anywhere uh, at any time without any complex procedures. So it's actually my personal experience that uh, moved me to the 100% in crypto. It's unbelievable. So 99.9%. Yeah. Okay. So before we uh, proceed, my name is Vinko Mihaljevic and this is Lud. So we explore human development on both an individual and a societal level. So today we have uh, Kirillo Komiakov, uh, who is a re regional head for Central and, and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, as what I know, maybe it's not official, but you told me uh, even, it is, even it is. Africa right, yes, right now. Right. So it's, it's unbelievable. Congratulations uh, for Binance. So yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. So what we'll do today, we'll explore why cryptocurrencies are compared to digital gold, uh, the rise of central bank digital currencies and crypto's role in financial innovation. Let me cool. say it like that. Okay, so uh, so can you explain why cryptocurrencies are sometimes compared to digital gold, and how does this affect their perception uh, as an inve investment asset? Yeah. So basically, uh, Bitcoin is the best ever asset class created by the humanity in terms of the growth of the price of it since first created uh, back in like 13 years ago, it's now more than 10 million percent growth in terms of the Bitcoin price versus it was what it was before. Uh, however, uh, it uh, has some risks too, because the crypto in general and Bitcoin in particular is quite a new assets class. It's not that big and liquidity is not that high as the traditional financial markets like forex, like stocks, like bonds, like gold. That's why it's quite volatile. So that's why you can get a high mm, uh, profits, but you can also have a higher risks when the prices are going down. So this young industry uh, is not that big in terms of the liquidity, and that's why any industry news, enforcement actions, regulatory changes can significantly influence the price. So the advice for the ones who are just starting in crypto is not to go all in, but just to invest a little bit, the amount that you are okay to lose easily. And then as you go along and get more experience, knowledge, and uh, being on the both positive and negative sides of things, continue investing more. So of course, the, the, the big uh, opportunities, but also the risks are high. Mm. So, yeah, that's the situation. So let, let us go back to the, to the beginning. Uh, so you were previously, you had roles in uh, traditional uh, financial system, ecosystems like, like banks, yeah. like commercial banks, uh, uh, not the gov governmental or central banks. So commercial banks. Yeah. Then was it uh, for 10 years or even yeah. longer? Yeah, it was a big chunk of time, I, I suppose, from my research. And uh, you moved after that in, in FinTech. Yeah. So you have, you have the, the experience of both traditional uh, financial systems, 
and uh, right now someone in, in between and the and the new one uh, that that we are looking uh, towards uh, in the future so can you maybe maybe you are one of the best people to talk uh, about that then uh, can you do a simple breakdown i know it's very hard to do so but si- simple breakdown of what do you think that money is hmm it's a very philosophical question basically but uh, uh the, the, to to put it simple money is the result of the value that person is created so the value you create for the society the value you create for the humankind is basically translated into the money that is given back to you for the value you deliver but that's uh, <laughs> that's very tricky question so that uh, to put it short way that how i would answer okay so what do you think that crypto or blockchain is is bringing to the to the scene uh, where where is the innovation here so if we are thinking about the money i suppose that in 1971 nixon removed uh, us dollar from the gold stand, standard uh, this was one of the most disruptive uh, points in in history for the money well was it not that much not that much we, we do not feel it yet right you think that we don't feel it yet well dollar still remains like a more the most stable most reliable currency in the world isn't it was well, still definitely but all other currencies so let let us call them fiat yeah uh, currencies mm-hmm. uh, they're all attached even right now to to the dollar so let me explain to the to the per- people watching you can correct correct me if i'm wrong so for every third party interactions for example if ukraine is uh, selling something to to turkey uh, the dollar is used okay so they are not using the the local currencies the national currencies but the dollar is Uh, uh, have, have, is, 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 is the currency that is that was using that was being used in those in those transactions uh, so, not necessarily right so that's the subject of the agreement between the countries but provided that every country wants to trade in their own currency and would never agree to something yeah. else that's why dollar became the like a global uh, global currency for the operati- operations and the transactions between the countries yeah. and that's where the the power of the dollar is coming from yeah of course we have uh, big poli- political powers and the military powers at the moment like china uh, like russia talking about moving away from the dollar or, or countries yeah. in the middle east as well so there are a lot of geopolitical inst- instabilities at the moment uh, but let, let me proceed on, on this thought of, of, of money Uh, and uh, what crypto then uh, innovates here so if we have fiat currencies and uh, before they were uh, tied to to the gold so us dollar was tied to the gold uh, after 1971 so you had this possibility to to print money so whatever you think of when i say the term print money so it's not really printing but it's typing like like yeah. two of us were typing just before it's much easier to than the, than to actually print it yeah. yes that's right so uh, what what is really that for example crypto or especially uh, bitcoin innovating here when you're compare, comparing it uh, to the traditional fiat currencies or us dollar for example yeah i thought you will you will ask uh, that the dollar was backed by gold what is bitcoin backed by so well, this so, is a good question as well so, Maybe bitcoin, we can... so bitcoin is backed by mathematics right and this is something you cannot uh, adopt so basically all the uh, all the fiat currency traditional currency they are deflationary right so the governments are printing more and more money every day inflationary inflationary yeah Oh, sorry, I said deflation. Yeah, inflationary. inflationary. Yeah, but the mm, but the Bitcoin supply is finite. So there is basically just 21 million Bitcoins, and this is never going to be more. And how many that. how many satoshis? Yeah, so you can then <laughs> mo- <laughs> multiply by 100,000, and that's going to be the number of yeah. the satoshis. So basically, that, that that's that's the power of the Bitcoin. It's just a finite supply of the first. Uh, 
and the most reliable crypto assets. And it's fully transparent. There is a, a lot of the visibility and there is a lot of the use cases for the Bitcoin. So basically that's the currency that cannot be manipulated by any government. And that's how it gets its power and that's why it's growing so, so fast. So it basically gives the people and to other governments the freedom the freedom of money. They do not need to be politically, economically, or in any other way connected to the other bigger countries or their own government to transact and be free. And that's actually what the main mission of Binance is, to achieve and give the people the freedom of money. And that's in everything that we do, this mission. Yeah. So from what I understood when I was... Uh learning for the first time about blockchain and crypto so there was a promise that everything was decentralized that there is no middleman yes. so for example i want to send some cryptocurrency to you there is no middleman but uh, at one moment for example uh, the company that, that you work for binance uh, uh, was started five years ago was it five? Seven, seven seven right now yeah 2017 seven, 2017 uh, so it, it was an idea from the beginning, but you have Binance, you have other companies as well um, that are in the role of intermediary be between people and organizations. Uh, so how do you think, uh, wh what do you think uh, uh, was, was, was this, uh, uh, what is the English word, uh, promise uh, s still on or, or is, it, is, it, is it off? No, it's, uh, it's still on. In order to achieve the mass adoption, you need to give to the millions of people easy way to do it. And uh, there is no easier way to do it than rather than the, through the centralized platforms, right? There is, of course, a, a slight uh, percentage of the uh, Bitcoin maximalists or crypto anarchists or whatever you call them that do not trust and do not uh, do not trust to any centralized exchange and don't want to pass the KYC, etc. So they want to they have full anonymity and full control of their assets. And it's actually an, a normal thing, right? There is a saying in crypto that not your keys, not your crypto. So if there is something you can do, there is a bunch of options to do it via the non-custodial wallets or even through the like separate... Uh, separate uh, devices to hold your crypto without transacting through the centralized exchanges. It's just much more easier, much more comfortable, much more user-friendly for the majority, 99% of the users. But it's just uh, making it easier without uh, trying to monopolize the industry. Mm. So uh, uh, when I asked you what what is... Uh a thing that crypto innovates on. Uh, so from what I understood, you, you told me that it in innovates uh, in the way that is, it is uh, stopping inflation, if I can express myself like that. So Bitcoin, so let, let us talk about Bitcoin, then we can talk about other cri cryptocurrencies as well. So Bitcoin is, is a blockchain as well, not, not just a cryptocurrency. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned the uh, the the characteristic of uh, being finite of of having only 21 million bitcoins we are still not there yet so they we need to mine i'm not sure how much uh, more bitcoin yeah, a couple uh, of million couple of million so far uh, i suppose it will last for probably 100 years around like that something something like that but uh, what other character characteristics can you can you mention that Bitcoin innovates on? Uh, so basically that's the, um, that cannot be controlled, right, by any government. So it cannot be political or economically influenced. Uh, this is fully transparent. So you can track down every Bitcoin from the time it was first mined to whatever it is right now. So it gives like much more clarity and transparency uh, to the industry. And uh, the most important thing that it goes through the very complicated uh, banking uh, and uh, central banking and commercial banking mechanics that's now getting super complicated these days. You need to have a bunch of the documents, you need to have a 
proof of uh, uh, proof of your uh, earnings. You need to have all these millions of the documents. It's long, it's complicated, it's expensive. And basically, um, that's the movement we see globally, that the people are migrating from the traditional finance to the Bitcoin and other altcoins, which is the new finance, finance to zero, which is faster, cheaper, easier, transparent, and uh, cannot be influenced by the governments. So when you say that you have uh, almost 100% of your assets, of your net worth in, in uh in cryptocurrency, which crypto cryptocurrency is it? So how how do you divide it, and how do you use it in everyday life? I suppose that, that you have uh, needs to to spend. Uh, mm, yeah, so to buy things. So so day to day basis. So what I'm saying is not a financial advice, right? <laughs> let me let me do a quick disclaimer here. So basically, most uh, is is in Bitcoin. There is some other uh, potential uh, interesting new. Uh, crypto projects uh, that are also there, but that's like a minority. Uh, yeah, and um, in at Binance uh, we can we cannot trade. There is a very strict rules um, about the trading for the Binance employees. So basically, we do not allow to be a day traders because the day trading is a it's a full full time profession, right? And CZ was very strict about that. So he said that if you want to be a trader, we are welcoming you to our platform. Please come and trade. But if you want to, to work at Binance, you cannot trade. So basically, we are um, we are having the rules that if you buy some assets for the 30 days, you cannot sell it. And that's very serious. For, for the violations, people can get fired for violating these rules. So basically... Myself, as all the other uh, Binance team, we are just uh, buying some crypto assets and holding it. So that's that's how we operate. So I suppose then then you you divide it between some stablecoin and probably a Bitcoin or Ethereum, maybe. No stablecoin, I don't have because it's you a don't have. it's a bull market. So we need to maximize the portfolio potential. Okay, so how do you go about your everyday? Uh, uh, spendings. So, do you use some maybe some Binance card? Oh, it's very easy. It's and uh, what, what what do you spend? Do you spend uh, Ethereum? Do you spend Bitcoin or do you spend stablecoin? No, I spend euro. I spend uh, Hungarian forints. There is a lot of the there is a lot of the methods now for the Binance users, both fiat and P 2 P. So if you want to sell any crypto, there is a bunch of options you have. You can directly send it to your card. You can send it via SEPA to your uh, banking account. You can use our P2P platform when the users are trading between uh, themselves, not through the uh, fiat providers. So there is uh, all these very cheap and very quick options how you can convert crypto to fiat and fiat to crypto. That's not a problem nowadays. You can also use... Mm, the cards uh, schemes, unfortunately, currently we have suspended a uh, Binance card program in Europe. Uh, however, we have a lot of the third party uh, providers, uh, the card issuers that are connected uh, via the API to your Binance account and you can issue their digital or physical cards and connect them to their wallets. And if you don't want to keep the uh, fiat even one euro in your account, you can uh, use these cards and it's auto-converted at the time of the payment. So mm -hmm. every, everyone selects the, the, the option they like. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure if you, if you answer this part of the question. So do you use your uh, crypto, uh, do you deposit it on exchange like Binance or do you deposit, in, deposit it uh, on, on the wallets? No, 100% what I got is on Binance. Everything is on Binance? Yeah. It's just to, to prove your loyalty to the company or do, do, you, uh, do you propose uh, for the people to do similar or why is no, everybody, it, no, why no, is everybody going to, uh, to the wallets uh, solutions? No, it's not everybody. It's actually a very, very small number of the of the population are using wallet solutions. So basically, it's not to prove the the, the loyalty. It's because it's more useful and more reliable and, and more secure. Okay. 
it's more secure. That, that that's yeah, that's the most important thing because I have a big family, right? And it's not about the loyalty; it's about like protecting my family first of all. So that's why I'm doing this. Basically, mm, there is a lot of scams and there is a lot of scammers in the crypto industry. And uh, methods these scammers are using are amazing right now. So the, the, they can use the AI to fake the ID and then register with the fake ID. They can do the, the social engineering methods to get to your device. They can do whatever, all these so sophisticated scammers are becoming right mm -hmm. now. So it's getting more and more complicated to protect your data and protect your devices, especially with the level of the usage we are having and interactions with our devices, right? The number of the applications, transactions, everything we are using, social networks, etc. So it's like super complicated to protect yourself, even for advanced users that I treat myself as an advanced user. So basically, um, centralized exchanges uh, and have their own risks, right? And, and this risk is that the centralized exchanges may go crazy and can start misusing your funds. That, that's what we saw with, for example, FTX situation, when they were misusing your funds. But I know what's happening on Binance. And uh, for the users, we put together a proof of reserves method, when you basically can go online and see the hot wallets of Binance and how much assets of what kind these hot wallets are holding. And you can ever check if your 001 of Bitcoin is a part of this wallet. So you can check your hash ID or transaction ID and confirm whether or not it is a part of this hot wallet, just to make sure the users can be sure that their funds are not uh, misused. As well as we are having a, a very mm, a strong security that's being protected by so-called Binance Ledger. That's a security stack that protects us, but uh, we operate on the, basic, on the basis that any security can be breached. And that's how we build uh, not just um, our security controls, but also our teams. So we have uh, 70, um, 70 crypto investigators that uh, partner with the law enforcement authorities around the globe. I don't know if you heard, but there was a recent scam with uh, ZK Casino, mm. the people that were doing the online gambling platform. And they basically was... Uh, offering this uh, uh, gambling and they scammed people for 30 million. So Binance together with the law enforcement helped to freeze these funds and basically these guys were arrested. So we have a big team working with the um, law enforcement. We have uh, hundreds of people of compliance that are working on the uh, IML, uh, KYC, uh, transactional monitoring things to protect our users. And we have a huge uh, customer support uh, desk that are using AI, etc. So these whole pillars are focused on protecting users from the technology perspective, but also help, you know, prevent any other external uh, risk factors. So that's why I trust Binance. So what do you think uh, are the key differences between uh, commercial banks and centralized exchanges for the crypto like like Binance. You mentioned some of the differences right now in the in your last answer, but maybe if you can mm, tell us. N not much, right? But th that's the same thing, but that's the in I intermediaries for the people's transactions from the past and from the future. It's basically the same idea of the intermediary, right? To make people easily and freely transact to support their everyday needs of spending and receiving money. It's just the new technology, right? The new way of thinking. And uh, more importantly, the new way of operating and uh, the different uh, vision and mission. But the, the, the idea and the concept is the same. So basically, when we are talking about the crypto, uh, firstly, what we need to talk about is the technology that it was built on, uh, its blockchain. Mm. So what blockchain brings 
innovatively that we have not seen before. It brings transparency. It brings uh, decentralization. In, in, in which way transparency? Uh, so I, I, I'm sure that you heard or there is so many uh, scammers in crypto. There is so many uh, illicit funds, uh, bribes, etc. But the funny thing is that if you compare the percent of the scam or illicit fund in crypto and percent of the scam or illicit fund in the traditional financial system, or percent of the illicit funds in cash, that is going to be much, much, way more bigger than in crypto, because the crypto is transparent. If you do one transaction, this transaction or this asset that you are holding can be tracked down to the very beginning once this asset was created. It's all there. Even the basic skill using chain analysis or some or crystal, the, the, these, these methods and these tools, you can easily track all the wallets, all the transactions. That's why I don't know if you noticed, but recently when the scammers scamming something, they have these assets, but they cannot spend it. So that's why very often for a very small bounty of like 5-10%, they are returning everything that they were able to scam from the victim because there is no use for them. It's better for them to keep 5 or 10 percent rather than not be able to use all this money because this crypto can be marked as illicit fund and that's it. You cannot do anything with crypto. So it, build, it brings transparency. It brings the new technology, it brings decentralized operations of the network, which is basically a lot of the validator, rather than the one computer or one server where everything can be so managed. So the same information is distributed to all the computers on the network? Exactly, because you cannot delete any information or any uh, you know, yeah, block, you cannot change block it. In, in, the, in the blockchain that's already happened. And that's why there is uh, zero potential for the manipulation. You know, uh, in, t in today's world where infor information goes like this, it's uh, when you cannot hide anything, it's very mysterious, or I can use <laughs> some other, other adjectives, uh, that we do not know who is behind technology like Bitcoin, because Bitcoin was the first blockchain ever developed. Uh, what, what are your, your opinions on that? Like, uh, who is Satoshi, you're asking? Yes. No. How, is, how is this possible that yeah. today's age and age we don't, do not know who is behind one of the most important technolo technological innovations? Usually people, when they invent something, everybody wants to say, I was the one who, do, who did this. But yeah. here nobody comes and says this. There are people. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who are saying that they are Satoshi, but... Yeah, so that's that's the beauty of it, isn't it? It's uh, it's so cool uh, that it's truly decentralized. And even if the creator, which is obviously one of the brightest minds uh, living uh, in the, our in the previous century, uh, even without this creator and without uh, his knowledge, his expertise, technology not just live, but also develops and become really great. So that's the beauty of the blockchain, isn't it? It is the beauty, but uh, in some people, I suppose that it, it brings uh, emotions of untrustworthiness, for example. In the in the in the end, <laughs> of course, technology works. It works. It's 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 unbelievable. But uh, some people uh, that are a little bit harder to trust. Uh, maybe they are thinking that some governments are behind it. Maybe some intergovernment uh, organizations uh, are behind it. You don't think about it, you just... Mm, and for these people, ETF was created. Yeah. So that's, right. that's exactly why the ETF uh, come into the play to open the crypto market to the tra traditional finance and the traditional thinking. So the people who was afraid, was not ready, was not trusting to open account to go through the KYC or to have their own crypto and have their own keys, now they can easily buy uh, this Bitcoin index through the ETFs offered by 
the big financial organizations like BlackRock, etc. And it's just the beginning of the trend. Basically, U.S. market is the biggest for the uh, liquidity globally, but uh, we can see other markets are following. So Hong Kong started this, uh, South Korea starting this soon, and I'm sure the others will follow. And that's a big, big thing for crypto because it opens the doors not just for people who distrust, but also for traditional financial institutions, for uh, funds, for pension funds, for these people that are sit sitting on the bags of money and will start investing into crypto too. What do you think that it, it is a, a better move to, to invent something like blockchain and crypto and disappear? <laughs> Uh, we, what what is the bigger bigger gangster move uh, to disappear? Like for example, Satoshi, if he's a only one person or maybe a team of people, or to to say that you are the the one behind it. Maybe this is this is even the bigger gangster move to to disappear and not not be there. Well, I think he disappeared because something happened to him. You think so? Yeah, that's what that, that's the only reason I see Satoshi still. Uh, remains one of the uh, most uh, uh, the, the richest people in the world, right? For the number of the Bitcoin he's holding in his wallet. But I think... Uh, How much does he hold? I think he's in the top 20 global. It's around like 60 or 70 billion dollars is his uh, the, 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 the current price of his wallet. Mm, uh, but it's not been moving since basically his last tweet. Yeah. So, but 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 I don't think that he like made the move, right? So the 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 industry is working, the the technology is working for every one of us of our benefit. Uh, are you aware of a person called Michael Saylor? Sure. Uh, what do you think about him and uh, his philosophy and uh, thoughts about Bitcoin? Oh, I love it. I love him. I think he's a great guy. So uh, his favorite saying is that like, uh, when are you going to be se selling your Bitcoin? So there is one rule in Bitcoin, you never sell your Bitcoin. That's what he says. And I think he has a brilliant idea, right? So he's just uh, buying Bitcoin and he's going to the uh, traditional markets and he's issuing more debt. He's issue issuing more shares and he's getting more traditional financial money and move it to the Bitcoin again. So that's a great combination between person that really trusts and move the crypto industry forward and benefits from the traditional financial money via this uh, corporatization mechanism. So I, I think he's one of the uh, great guys in the industry. Uh, so I was uh, a, a part of the conference today that, that you were speaking on mm. uh, and I was uh, listening uh, what what you were speaking about. Uh, can you tell me about safety in, uh, in this world, in cryptocurrency, blockchain? Uh, so what is um, Binance doing right now? Uh, uh, I suppose that this is your biggest role. This is your primary role in, in, the, in the company. Uh, not just safety, but uh, compliance to the governments and uh, relationship with the governments and uh, uh, making sure that everything fits correctly on, on the regulation side. So you said security and then compliance. That are two different yeah. things. Let's, let, let's, let's start with, with compliance then. Yeah, so compliance is a big thing, basically the biggest thing for the crypto industry right now. So initially, back into 2017, 2019, there was no compliance, there was no regulation, that was nothing, because everyone thought it is just a joke. And then uh, it, it will not move on, and it will, like a new hype, it will go away after a couple of years. But when the governments understood that this, is not, this will not go away, despite the fact all the negative things they were doing for the uh, crypto, uh, and they understood that this is big and it is getting bigger quite fast, uh, they started to think how to regulate it, which is basically a good thing to do, right? Because government needs to, to, to protect their people, their users. 
And that's where uh, the compliance thing started and when the compliance became really, really important for the industry. So basically, uh, all the stakeholders, which is government organizations, businesses like ours, and the users, we want all one thing. We want to have crystal clear framework, the set of rules where we all agree to follow. This will remove all the misunderstandings and we all will go together ahead. So that's what the governments are trying to achieve, but provided that's, that's a new industry, it not goes without uh, mistakes, without delays, without disagreement between the stakeholders. But eventually I'm sure uh, we will get there and the crypto will be regulated as a traditional finance right now, and we're all gonna work in the uh, very uh, clear, clear set of rules. Uh, but every government takes their own very different approach to the compliance and regulations. And for the global organization like ours, it's a challenge to follow the specific requirements in every country, which is very, very different, even in every European country. It's very, very different, right? So we need to be uh, we need to be aware of all the news, we need to be aware of all the laws, and we need to work with the regulators in every country to support them and help them as the industry leader, basically, to uh, be competitive in this compliance market. Because the, the, the industry is not just exchanges and trading. There's billions and billions of dollars that are being invested in the new Web3 projects. And for this project to sell, for these projects to select one or another regulation, so one or another country, and basically create jobs, start paying taxes for this, these projects are selecting lower taxes and clearer regulation. So there is a big competition between the countries in the world and even between the countries in Europe, who will make more user friendly, business friendly regulation that will attract more businesses, more crypto businesses to come and build in this specific country. So that's the processes are going on in compliance space. Is, is this your main role in, in, the, in the company at the moment, in, in those countries that, that you're responsible for? Yes and no. My main role is the growth and marketing. So I enable uh, community growth, crypto adoption and the growth of our business in all our countries. And in the countries where we have regulation existing or coming, we have uh, help from the regulatory compliance team that helps us to work with the regulators in this space. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what, what is the difference between uh, regulation in commercial banks and crypto exchanges like Binance? Is there some difference or the rules are the same? So that, that's what I'm saying, very different per country, right? So here in Europe, mm, we will finally have one regulation across Europe. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, I suppose that the regulations uh, in the context of uh, commercial banks are the same in European Union, uh, country by country. Traditional finance is one of the most regulated uh, like uh, industries globally maybe along with pharmaceuticals. So it's a very regulated industry. And I think that the, where, where MICA gets us is to the same space. So very, very regulated, uh, very strings and uh, rules. So eventually uh, crypto uh, trading companies like ours will be more or less the same way regulated as banks. So I wanted to ask you something, but then my mind went blank. Uh, a few moments ago, uh, I remember it right now. So I was, we were talking about a Michael Saylor, uh, and uh, you, you mentioned ETFs a uh, few moments uh, before that. Uh, so I was, I was thinking, for example, if a person who is not well educated or is a, is a pro user like like yourself, for example and uh, he wants to invest in Bitcoin. Uh, I, I had a thought that maybe it's, it's best, it's better idea not to invest directly into Bitcoin or to in, into ETFs, but really to invest in MicroStrategy, which is the company of Michael Saylor, because 
in my knowledge, he 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 is uh, the biggest holder of Bitcoin right now. He as as a person, and his company, MicroStrategy, and when you see his uh, average price uh, of of the Bitcoin that that he has uh, at the moment, it's I think it's around. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, something like that. No, he is not the biggest. He is in the top five. The biggest was GBTC, the grayscale BTC fund that was offering the futures, uh, and the second one is U.S. government. Okay. Yeah, because they seized a lot of the BTC in the past from the different enforcement actions, but and, and they still hold it. Mm, yeah. So, Mike, so this, this is just a prom- promotional. So Michael Saylor is, is somewhere in the in the top five, yes. And uh, basically, his average price is above uh, fifty-five or is so, it? so. Yes, it is. So it's just he he, he has crossed this break-even point recently, on the uh, in, in March, just in March. But when the Bitcoin started growing ahead of six above sixty. He started to show the paper profits of billions and billions and billions every day. So yes, I think it's some, it's somewhere around 56 or 57. I might be wrong, but for a small number. So yeah, uh, and you can right? You can uh, buy the micro strategy uh, stocks. I think it's available for both U.S. people or, or here people in Europe, but. Uh, can someone in Ukraine buy it? No. Can someone in Africa buy it or in China or in Indonesia? The answer is no. And whether or not uh, his stocks are going to be growing the same fast as the Bitcoin if you buy it, most probably that's also a questionable thing. So, but but, but you, you're right. Everyone is investing uh, in a way that the person feel comfortable, right? You can buy Bitcoin, you can hold it yourself, you can hold it with centralized exchanges, you can hold it uh, with the wallet, with the ledger wallet, with the ETF, with the stocks of someone who invests in the Bitcoin. There's all this bunch of options now available. Mm. Yeah, I suppose that, uh, so for example, at the moment in Croatia, it's it's it's, it's safe uh, period. So we don't, we do not have wars, and uh, so the last war here in the Balkans were was in 1991, lasted uh, for for a few years, and uh, it's it's funny how people <coughs> fast. When I say fast, it's 30 years. They forget that it, it is a real possibility right now. For example, you in U- Ukraine, you know that is yeah. a real uh, possibility, and uh, you're right. Uh, so when you are in situation like that, like that. It's better to have, for example, your keys in your head and uh, your uh, bitcoins in a wallet or, or some uh, exchange. In my opinion, it's, it's still better to, uh, for them to be in the wallet. <coughs> and then uh, when, you, when you move, you can still have some uh, resources and you can protect your family, exactly. as you said. Yeah. Uh, there was a... I, I stumbled upon one uh, on uh, on one funny uh, uh, quote. Uh, the guy has some funny uh, X, so the, the former Twitter uh, profile, and he said something. I will paraphrase it. Uh, he says, "Why do miners sell Bitcoin if it is so profitable?" Mm. And he's then he wrote. Checkmate, <laughs> like <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so why do things the the miners sell it when they, I suppose they should get it for the for the least amount? Well, it's very easy because uh, the mining is just uh, uh, is just a profitable business, but the most uh, of the cost is basically the hardware and the electricity that they need to pay for. So that's why they are selling. I think that the reasonable um, profit is around 20%. So 80% of what they get, they need to to sell to cover for this uh, um, this, uh, operational costs. So uh, when we are thinking about governments and uh, central banks, 
central banks should be somehow uh, independent from the governments. Mm. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, they should. <laughs> it's a promise. It's a promise. They should. It's a but they're not. Pinky swear. But they're not. Uh, but they're not. Yeah. So, uh, how do you see that uh, central banks will move in the future? Because, as you said, it, you cannot stop uh, blockchain. You cannot stop uh, Bitcoin uh, in doing what 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 it, what it is doing right now. So, philosophically speaking, right, the central bank's main customer is the government of this country, right? And whether or not this government needs money, central bank is lending from the people to invest this money, to give, to loan this money to the governments. That's how the central bank operates. Basically, the more money central banks lends from the people and gives to the government, uh, the higher the GDP is and the happier the people are. So that's the circle of life in every country. That's how it's happening. And as we get closer to elections, the, this amount of lending and spending by the governments is usually increasing a lot for people to be happier and to vote for the same candidate. So that's how uh, usually the central bank uh, central banks operates. However, uh, from the uh, uh, you you were asking about CBDC, right? Mm -hmm. From the CBDC perspective, I don't see it as a threat to the crypto. So maybe you, you you can say to the people, uh, CBDC is central bank digital currency. Yeah. So the, the, the that's all thing that all the central banks were talking ab about uh, for years, and I think it's a, actually a very good uh, thing because first of all. It's a good use case for the blockchain in general, right? Because it's going to be big, built on the blockchain. But secondly, it's going to be easier for users, much more eco-friendly and much cheaper. So basically, if the instead of the euros in our pocket or on our cards, we will have the CBDC euros, it's going to be absolutely the same, but it's going to, it, does, it will not need uh, the layer of the commercial banks. The CBDC, the central banks can mint and deliver these digital euros directly to to the users and vice versa. The only negative thing to think to this is that for the people who do not want to have a full control of the authorities of their finance and their spendings, that's most probably the only issue because the, 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 the central banks will have full control of what you have, where you get this money, where you spend this money. It's going to be like a 100% transparency. But for crypto, it's not bad because this, the digital euros or digital dollars, they will never be able to replace the Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? That's not even the purpose. The whole purpose of this is to increase the transparency and make the whole operations cheaper, basically by removing the physical cash, the bank's transaction, uh, the, the net, like Visa, MasterCard, payment schemes and the banks and directly disperse from the central bank to users and vice versa. So if I understood you correctly, you're saying that uh, CBDCs would remove intermedia intermediaries like commercial banks? Yeah, there is different methods, right? The, the, the minting entity can be commercial bank too, if the central bank is basically dedicates this commercial bank to mint. But in any, in any format, it will be cheaper and easier for everyone. And um, in the end of the day, better for for the people. So I'm I I don't see anything uh, bad in the CBDCs. Yeah. So when you're saying about transparency, so for example, governments could see all the details of of transactions uh, of the of the of its citizens. But uh, I suppose that uh, transparency should go vice versa as well, of what is central bank doing and what is the government doing with, with money, is it? It should, yes. <laughs> it should. <laughs> yeah. It should, yes. And uh, technically, uh, technically it is the case. So there is, uh, uh, there is a budget, right? Uh, every year the budget is being uh, prepared and it should be public what's the budget of every government and technically if the people doesn't like this budget they have to vote for another government 
So that's the theory of the democracy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so in your personal opinion, so when we are talking about trust, do you think that the trust in the governments uh, are going up or down recently? In the governments? Oh, I'm not an expert in the politics, to tell the truth. But um, but I think it, it, is, it is important. Uh, let me say in mainstream organizations, is it media, is it uh, commercial banks or traditional organizations, which are, people are thinking that they are tied some, somehow to the governments. Uh, we saw uh, Twitter files, uh, what uh, Facebook did uh, in the last elections in US. We have a lot of elections this year as well. So we had the election here in Croatia recently. We will have election on the European Union level. Uh, we, we will have election in USA, uh, in India. So a lot of things could possibly change in the in this year. Yeah, so is trust going up or down? Uh, uh, macroeconomically speaking and macro politically speaking, uh, the trust in the governments and of the overall uh, democracy societies is the highest ever. All time high. Really? Right now. Because if we zoom out a little bit and see what was happening like 50 years ago, it was a complete chaos, right? The people were very poor. There was no access to the education. We, we could not even imagine the level of the quality of life we are having right now. Like hot, hot shower, even kings were not having it, right? 100 years ago. So the level of the comf comfort for the humanity that we are having right now, the level of the amount of work we need to do to get these basic things, and the level of the mm, how easy it is to live these days is unimaginable right now. And this all happens because of this mm, concept of the social trust between people and the governments. And that's what's uh, happening right now. So despite all this election, some turbulence, the level of the trust to these systems that we are having right now is the highest ever. However, it's quite fragile, right? And we think it's like very, st very stable, nothing can happen, but a lot of things can happen very, very quick. So I think we need to respect what we are having right now and protect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, when, when we are talking about uh, conformity, is, is that a good word? Yeah. Uh, being comfortable, for example. No? Uh, you're absolutely right, but uh, somehow uh, your perspective is, uh, or your perception is much different than mine. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very refreshing t to me to see that a person of your caliber has this opinion that the trust in, in governments is on all-time high at the moment. Yes. It's interesting uh, thought. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, how do you think that all those uh, global economic ch changes, political political changes, could affect uh, the industry that, that you're in? For example, the Bitcoin or central exchanges, blockchain and things like that. So technically, I shouldn't comment on the U.S., but I cannot hold on uh, doing this. Basically, do. <laughs> uh, and that's only my personal opinion. That's not a Binance position or anything like that. So all the uh, eyes of the uh, global, mm, global uh, politically active community are tied to the uh, elections in U.S., right? And it's funny uh, to see that uh, how the crypto card is being played there. Mm -hmm. So they call it first crypto election, right? Because more and more people in crypto and the candidates are basically uh, playing on this uh, crypto support thing. So even in the US, which is the biggest traditional financial uh, market, uh, the crypto is one of the key topics that will basically define the results uh, of these elections this year. So I think it's like h hard to overestimate uh, the impact of the crypto, not just in US, uh, but globally. Mm, so, yeah. So what, what is the thing that you think about every day 
uh, I'm talking about the context of, of your business and your industry, uh, but the regular, regu regular person does not see yet. Maybe you can give us some hint where to look at. So uh, Binance, since the creation uh, in uh, August 2017, became the first global crypto exchange by the December the same year. And by now, Binance is the biggest growing startup in the world ever created in all the industries. And uh, that's a phenomenon, right? So how do you how how do you achieve it? What capabilities CZ, the founder team, or the operational team was having to achieve these amazing results? And I think the quick an answer to this question is that we really put our users first. So the key thing in everything that we are doing, starting from giving this interview ending with the building uh, new products and uh, getting the new licenses across the globe is focused on what our users need. Whether or not it will help our users to achieve something, whether or not it will make them more comfortable, how does it solve their everyday problem? So I think th th that's the key to our success and there is our secret sauce how the Binance was able to perform. And all the employees... Uh, within Binance are basically uh, breezing this idea, including myself. So whenever I travel, whenever I, uh, and this is what keeps me up at night, I'm just thinking, what else do I need to give our users? How else I need to make this community together, give them the meetup, understand more their needs, or, or solve some individual user problem that cannot have an answer from the customer support. To, to help them like uh, using crypto better. So that's uh, the cornerstone of everything our company and myself are doing. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the answer. So I was asking if, if what is the thing that you are thinking about every day that the regular person does not see that could help this regular person in the context of, of blockchain uh, crypto so that's, that's, that, that's what I'm saying. Basically, we are getting this feedback from other users and we are channeling this feedback inside our organization, whether it is to compliance, to product, to the tech, to security, uh, to, to any other teams, so that we do our work better every day. So, for example, user does not know how to withdraw his Bitcoin and having the high commission, etc. We give them the, the Binance card user uh, is struggling to apply the best trading strategies because it's a new user. So we give them the copy trading so that they can copy, uh, copy the big traders strategy, mm -hmm. uh, earn money and also learn on that. Or basically Balkans users, they cannot, uh, they were not being able to use Binance app on their native language. So they're stra stra struggling with English. So we give them the local language. Or they miss this community feeling. We give them the first ever local meetup. So these type of things, we are thinking about the users. They might not see it every day, but they get it as the result based on the feedback of our other users. Mm. So... Uh, what would you like to see uh, in the future that Binance or other exchanges would tackle uh, to bring more ease of use in this in this industry in your in your platforms or in the whole ecosystem, not not just the platform? What do you think that uh, still frustrates the users that it could be simpler? Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. So basically, for the crypto adoption, we need to have a more engagement with our partners. So with the banks, with the retail, with the regulators. So crypto needs to become not something complicated or, or something new, but the, the, the main means of payment. Something that is secured, protected, regulated, available and cheap. 
and that's how we can build the crypto adoption and that's how we can get to 1 billion users. But currently it's complicated because of this lack of trust situation that happened after a couple of these big failures in the industry that created a gap of trust from users and from regulators to crypto. And unfortunately, it's thrown back our industry a couple of years behind. And that's what we are, as the responsible industry leader, are trying to catch up on. So if we would like to, to leave this next minute or, or, or two, we will see how much uh, time would you need to, to explain it. Uh, if, if you would like to explain what do you do uh, and what industry are you in and what is this technology uh, and you're trying to find very simple communication, very simple words to describe it to the young child and to describe it to the, to the, to the old person, how would you des describe it? Uh, blockchain or crypto blockchain, or Binance. Crypto. Yeah, blockchain crypto. Yeah. So that's that, that, that's a, the new way of uh, financial operations for every person. Do you think the, that the child will understand? That, that <laughs> that's the well. If the if the child has the money, she, he should understand, right? So that's the future. It's tomorrow, tomorrow's day. How you're gonna be operating with your finance and your your relationships with the world in terms of the money wise. So that's something that is more useful, easier, more profitable, and in the end of the day, much, much more useful for you. So how do you see the, the future of AI and crypto and blockchain together? Oh, that's AI. I love it. I love this question. It, it, it's, an, it's another huge topic, and I can... Uh, I, I, can, I can be excited about uh, talking about this, but I'll try to get uh, straight to the point. So basically, I'll be excited. I like that. Yeah. So basically, AI is something that can uh, break this fragile trust of the governments and of the people. So when the AI is fully in force, governments will not be needed as such. However, the only way... Uh, AI can operate as the new way of life, if you will, right? If you if you would like to consider it like this, or as a new way of the of the consciousness. The only way how it can operate is only through the blockchain. There is no other way, because AI to operate needs just one thing, right? It needs computer power, and in order to procure this computer power. It needs the payment. And basically, AI cannot open the bank account, right? Because it will not pass the KYC. The only way for AI to buy this life power, which is a computer power, is through the blockchain. So there was one interesting... Um, can, you, can, you ex can you expand a little bit? Because it, yeah. it was very... Uh, Interesting thought. So you said, can you repeat from the from the beginning? So you you brought up the words consciousness, blockchain, and AI in one sentence. Yeah. Can you can you break it down a little bit more? Uh, I, I'll give I'll give you an example, right? So there was a task uh, of uh, two AI uh, that says. Um, Take one thousand dollars and earn one million on Amazon. And AI can easily uh, evaluate what's interesting to the to the users of Amazon, where these goods can be produced, how to uh, find the producer in China of these goods, how to contract, how to arrange the logistics, how to sell it in the Amazon and how earn from $1,000, $1 million. AI can do all of this without human interactions, except of one thing. It cannot open a banking account because banking account is only available for either an individual person or the company created by this individual person. So AI cannot open the banking account. But if you can imagine the same 
business model of AI, uh, and let's say we want the AI will 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 want to do something. Let's say it's AI who is uh, making uh, the podcasts uh, with some interesting guests. So this AI, the only option for this AI to operate would be to charge these guests or the viewers, depends on the business model, in blockchain. And for this blockchain, buy computing power to develop itself. And the only way to do it is through the blockchain. There is no other way for AI to be developed except of getting this life power, computer power, through the blockchain financial system. And the re the reality is getting even more weir weirder for me right now. So, <laughs> yeah, we all need to be <laughs> careful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, I will I will go in that direction. So listen to me carefully. So, of course, uh, the left, uh, United States, <laughs> like Elon calls it, the wo woke mind virus. Uh, so. We are even right now, right now we are even uh, thinking about uh, the most fundamental human uh, ideas or facts, what is a man, what is a woman, things like that. So when you told me AI, consciousness and blockchain, the first question that popped into my mind after that was if we are thinking about what is a woman or man, I suppose the next next question would be in the context of AI, what is a person? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what Turing test is, right? Turing test. Yeah. To know if you're a computer it's, or... It, it's, it's how to differentiate a computer from something else. So if you're talking to this and you can say that you're talking to a computer, that's why the, it hasn't passed the test. But if you are talking to this instance and you cannot say that you are not talking to the person, that means that this test is passed and it's not a computer anymore. So can AI pass the Turing test? Mm, yes, I think so, yes. So is it a person? Uh, well, that's the, something that we need to define together with all the mankind, right? How to treat this new uh, instance, this new, uh, the, the, this new creation. So I suppose then in the future uh, AI could uh, go through know your customer regulation. Yeah, so that's why that, that, that's why AI that doesn't need it, right? Uh, because there is other ways like blockchain to do it. Mm. So what, what interesting? I, I suppose when I, I saw that your lights uh, that your eyes light up a little bit when when we started talking about AI. Uh, so how? How hands-on are you on, on AI and how do you use it on, in everyday life? You mean Binance? You. And you and Binance, yeah. No, I'm, more, uh, I'm, I'm not in any source of the, the scientist. I'm just a, a concerned citizen, you know. And I'm just using the chat GPT. And that's it. And uh, at Binance, we are also having our, uh, our, our version of the... AI for the everyday needs. It helps a lot our marketing teams, our CS team, our transactional monitoring teams. So they are using a lot of AI. So we also see that there is a huge interest uh, to the AI uh, Web3 projects. There is, uh, well, overall last year, the, why, I'm, why I'm so excited because this this the, this the next big thing, right? It will change our, our world and our, our lives very, very soon. But just in terms of numbers, just last year, more than $100 billion was invested in the AI-related projects. Not the blockchain, but just funded. And we see the same trend in the crypto. So all the uh, AI-related token, they were growing through the bear market and they continue to growing right now. So that's like an overall trend that's happening right now. So uh, what can we expect uh, in the Balkans? I'm trying to find a better term uh, rather than Balkans. I don't know why, but here Balkans has some kind of a bad name. 
Uh, so how, do, how, how do you call it? Tell me, and I will a lot of, I'll, I'll a lot change of, my terminology. Too. No, no, no. It's you, 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 you don't need to change it. It's a, it's a geographical uh, position. So it's, but uh, somehow I, I see that people are going away from this term Balkan. Uh, a lot of people are calling it region. <laughs> region. Yeah. For example, when we are talking about Slovenia, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, so ex ex Yugoslavia countries. Uh, some are calling it Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Europe, sorry, <laughs> not Asia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Southeast Europe. But uh, okay, uh, what do you see uh, uh, from the Binance uh, perspective new uh, here in, in, in this region? We have a lot of plans and first of all this is to localize our presence and to give like maximum comfort and the community feeling to our local users. So we're going to localize our app and web language shortly. We're going to localize all the uh, Binance Academy courses by the midsummer. We're going to do two local meetups for our community in Q3 and Q4. One on the seashore and another one uh, here in Zagreb in Q4. Uh, we are going to... Uh, we already created our local social media in the local languages. And, um, what else? Uh, we, we're going to invest a lot on, in the edu uh, in the education. We think it's a it's a big thing, and, and that's the value we need to give our users. So we're going to be doing the projects like a crypto school, that uh, will be done in the local language for the newbies in crypto. That's uh, based on the learn and earn basis. So basically, you will have a set of the connected courses for four, five, six hours. And after every course, you will have a small test. If you pass the test, you get some USDT to your account. So it will motivate you to know better crypto because before you really start investing. So I want to protect our users, right? First of all, to for them to be successful. So this type of things. Mm. Very exciting things. Uh, so how often are, uh, are you personally here in, the, in this part of the world? It's actually my first time here because really? because to my region uh, Balkans uh, joined just recently. So Bal Balkans joined to see Central and Eastern Europe within uh, Binance. We reshaped it uh, just a few months ago. So we started with uh, getting uh, the right team together to manage it. Uh, who is who are the uh, local speaking team, and uh, we started to build on that provided the experience we were having in another country to make it a success uh, quite uh, quickly. So it's actually my first time in Croatia because uh, it was out of my region just a few months ago, but I really love it and I hope to be here as soon as possible, not just in Zagreb, but in other parts of Croatia too. Yeah, I think that you will love it. So uh, it, it is an interesting question for me. Uh, when you think of Croatia, what what, for it, uh, what are the first thoughts that, that pop into your mind? Dragons. Dragons, really? The Game of Thrones, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this is the first thing, really. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I, I, I just wanted to be on the seashore for quite a while. So the places like Split, Dubrovnik, uh, these type of things. I heard a lot about the Mediterranean cuisine in Croatia, beautiful, warm um a sea etc so now i will also come with my family for the vacation this summer so i'm looking forward to exploring uh, croatia from both business and personal reasons nice if you need some tips i'm here cool thank you very much yeah. so guys if if you enjoyed this discussion uh, please consider supporting lud by becoming a member of youtube channel uh, membership starts at 4.99 a month and gives you an, uh, gives you an access to exclusive content, early episode access, and the ability to ask questions uh, directly to to our guests. Uh, details are in the video description. Kirillo, thank you, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Great, thank you, thank you for having me. Looking forward next time too. Yeah.